The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, coming up on this edition of today's verdict, the basketball world watched as Kevin Durant fell in a crumbled heap to the floor during the NBA Finals. Injuries happen all the time during professional sports, but could this one have been prevented? Were doctors to blame, and if so, who is ultimately responsible for a player's physical condition? A rising star in the world of sports law will be on set to give us his legal opinion. Next up, adolescents often go through the long, unnecessary process of arraignment as they are sometimes left for over 24 hours chained to precinct benches. An advocacy group will be in studio to let us know all they are doing to fight for the underaged and accused. Finally, as social media drastically evolves, attorneys are using your online postings to help successfully argue a case. But is this an invasion of privacy, and what can you do to protect yourself? As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. All right, hello, welcome to today's verdict, the live and interactive show that gives you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. Well, today's verdict is always encouraging you to stay connected. Make sure to tweet us and hashtag ask today's verdict if you have a question. Also, make sure to like us and follow us on Facebook at today's verdict and check us out at bronxnet.tv. Well, Kevin Durant may be the best basketball player in the world, but he also cannot play any games for at least nine months. Could his injury have been prevented? Is a medical malpractice case warranted? We're here to tell us more about his article, The Impending Durant Warriors Lawsuit That No One Is Talking About, is sports attorney Dan Lust. Dan, I've been looking forward to this segment for a couple of days now. Uh, I'm a sports guy. Um, uh, I don't even know where to begin because it looks like uh, there's so much to discuss and so much potential money if there's a malpractice case. But first tell me, what gave you the impetus to even write this article. Tell us. Right. I think uh, as a sports attorney, right, you have to approach this from the, the sports mindset and also as an attorney, right? So as a, a Knicks fan, I think a lot of us were hopeful that Durant was coming to us. <laughs> so when I heard the rumors that he was trying to come back and play, uh, you know, the, my Knicks fandom in me said, well, Kevin, maybe you should just rest up and heal up and then, and then come back. So for, for the viewers that, that don't know, uh, May 8th of 20, uh, 2019, during the Rocket Series, Durant went down with what they were calling was a calf injury, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but a month later, without playing, he comes back in Game 5 of the Finals. Um, for those Knicks fans out there, we might have shades of Willis Reed coming back. Um, and I, I just remember seeing this as a Knicks fan, as an attorney, when he fell to the floor, you know, and he crumbled down. I just kind of said to myself, I mean, doctors were there to, to tell him the, the proper risk, and I really hope that that's what they did. You know, there always seems to be, um, in professional sports, that balance. You have a contract that you're paying out on a professional athlete and you want them out there, yet at the same time you have an athlete who might say, well, I can't get out there. They're really competing interests, you know, and, and they say, well, we're paying you. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what, is, what happens while a player is, you know, on the, on, on the disability or, or where he is sitting, sitting at home. Who's evaluating him? Are, there, are they NBA doctors? Uh, are they um, his own doctors? What generally goes on? Right. So 2018 gave us a really good example of this. So Kawhi Leonard is, a, is a, you know, the MVP of the NBA Finals. He was with the San Antonio Spurs at that point in time. So the protocol is put in place for a reason. There's, the NBA says that the team has to provide clearance and also the player has to provide clearance. So unless you get both, you don't come back to the floor. So the Spurs in this instance in 2018 said that Kawhi's ready to go. They looked at his meds. They said he's, he's clear. Kawhi didn't trust the medical staff, and he ended up sitting at home and staying on the couch and ended up forcing his way out of town. Right, which cost, you know, really cost them, the team, a player in the next year. Maybe, the, maybe the best player in the NBA. In the NBA. So you, you do have to understand that the, the player knows their own body, right. and it feels that they're not being treated properly. They're obviously not going to be happy, and if, 
nobody, they don't have to get on the floor, and you could alienate a player. Um, but with Durant, it didn't seem that way. It looked like he wanted to play. Right. And that's going to lead to what we're discussing now, and that's a potential medical malpractice claim. Mm. So maybe tell the viewers a little bit about what we mean when we term terms of medical malpractice and, and a player. Right. So I think in sports cases, as, you know, as a sports attorney, we practice, you know, have a lot of cases, maybe a basketball injury, a football injury. Um, there's a doctrine called assumption of the risk. And you can assume some risks by playing, but you can't assume risks that you aren't aware about. And that's where this medical malpractice suit would lie. Um, so for those, you know, the, the basic elements, and this would be a case that we brought in the state of California, just based on where the Warriors are based, where Durant lived. Um, but that's this duty breach causation harm equation. Okay. Um, here, you know, the doctors owe a duty to Durant as a patient of the team, and they have to show that um, among a number of ways you could breach that duty, one of which that I view here is they didn't properly tell him that there was a risk of an his Achilles tear. Um, Jay Williams, his very close friend, went on Sports Center the next day yeah. and said that he knew for a fact that Durant was told that there, that by the Warriors that there was no chance that he could tear his Achilles. Um, and, and David, he, I mean, he tore his Achilles. You know, and when you talk about causation and actually proving that the malpractice itself was what led to the right. injury, I guess, you, I mean, if you make the claim, well, it's, it was the calf we were treating. We told him that he could play. He wouldn't injure his calf. Is it a stretch to say, well, you know, you didn't really look at whether a calf is really connected to the Achilles, you know, the, the arm bone to the hip bone kind of thing? I mean, what do you, is, isn't that a defense, mm -hmm. really? I mean, can't you say, well, there's no causation here. Even if we did make a mistake, we made a mistake with the calf. Right. Nothing to do with the Achilles. So it's funny. Doctors have come out since then, and, and we know our bodies, right? Our calf's located right next to the Achilles, and we know that Durant asked about his Achilles, and we know the response to that question from someone in Durant's circle was no chance of an Achilles tear. But to your point about causation, there's always the temporal element of this, and I think it's important to remember how Durant fell, right? We remember years ago as sports fans when Willis McGahee for the Miami Hurricanes he had that knee to his, the helmet to the knee, but, you know, tore his Achilles. He was never the same player. This wasn't a contact injury. He just, Durant was posting someone up at the three-point line and just collapsed. Down. And this was very important here. 14 minutes into the game, and 14 minutes into the game when he had played the first 12, basically like a car going from zero to 100 miles an hour. So that's all part of the risk assessment. How quickly he could come back, how much he could play is all on the doctors. Now we had, it's funny, last week we actually, or two weeks ago when we did a show, we, we discussed workers' compensation, mm -hmm. and that's when you're injured on the job and then you can't bring a lawsuit against your employer because you've been injured on the job. There's a workers' compensation element here, isn't there? So talk about that and how we get around that if, right. we, if we even if we could. So the fans that, the, the watchers, the listeners that know this, I mean, you'd see Bill Walton in 1978 had a very similar lawsuit. Dick Butkus had a similar lawsuit. But there's a gap of maybe 20, 30 years where we don't see lawsuits like this. Um, and that's because workers' comp laws around the country have, have changed. And now normal medical malpractice can be covered by comp. The reason that this is a, a case that exceeds comp, and it wouldn't be preempted by workers' compensation, and the reason we're talking about a scary number like a billion dollars, um, is because there's an element here which Jay Williams, again, Durant's friend who got on Sports Center the next day and said this, he said at the time they rendered this risk assessment that the Warriors didn't have his best interest at heart because they knew he was leaving. And that is an allegation that seems to be a t colorable aspect of fraudulent right. concealment. Right, and if it's fraudulent, or should we right. say it's not just negligence, but you're, you're moving more right. to the intentional level, right. you're taking yourself out of any workers' comp, and then you actually have the ability to bring a lawsuit. Right, and that's why any type of waiver in his contract, public policy wouldn't allow fraud to be covered. You know, so I read, the, I, I read your, your, um, your article, loved it. Wasn't sure about one thing. I think you cleared it up for me uh, offset, and that's the statute of limitations. Of in other words, when your time runs in terms of bringing a lawsuit, and in California, we know that's three years. Mm -hmm. But when does it run? Is it when he's crumpled on the floor? Does it run from when he's in the, in the trainer's room and they make the misdiagnosis? Yeah, so he practiced on June 8th, okay? So that's one date. That's the first date they allowed him to practice. The injury happened on June 10th, and the one that we talked about ahead of time, the initial injury, which people are saying maybe was always a partial Achilles tear, that was on May 8th. So, you know, if you're Durant's attorneys in this equation, if you want to play it safe and you want to allege you misdiagnosis, improper risk assessment, you'd be safe and maybe you'd circle, right? And, I, and this is to your point, maybe you'd circle May 8th. Um, but the reason and the way you get around, right, um, this workers' comp as being your exclusive remedy is with this fraudulent concealment element, which I don't think comes in quite, you know, that early on May 8th. I'm going to read you something from that came from the 2013 research paper. Uh, uh, American paper. Journal of Sports Management. That's right. Players only have a 38.9% chance of ever Crazy. playing in the NBA again after suffering this injury. Crazy. And of those that returned, 27% played only one more season for have, before having their NBA career end early. That's not looking good. It's not, unless your name is Dominique Wilkins. Right, but that's, but that's rare. That's the Dominique only player. Dominique was the only one who that ever really happened to 30 him. years ago. 
Okay. Um, so, so the important part here, and we have some very, you know, and I'm sorry, Nets fans, I hate to be the bearer of bad <laughs> news, but Kobe Bryant in 2013 had this injury. He was at, at the top of his game. He retired after two years. So let me ask you a question. Let's just say he does play, mm -hmm. but he doesn't play at the same level right. and still and gets a less of a contract mm -hmm. extension. How would you even determine the damages? Because you have to determine right. damages. Right. You, it's your it's your obligation as the medical malpractice attorney to prove damages. How do you prove that? So sports fans are, are, are quick to say, well, he signed a max contract. So he signed maximum. Maximum means that he can have no damages, which is just not accurate in the law. Um, and as I've explained to people, there's two elements of this. There's the off-court earnings and there's the on-court earnings. So off the court, if I'm an, an advertiser, um, if Durant's not playing for another year and a half, I'm probably less likely to invest in him. This, let me tell you something. This there's is, a lot. This is fascinating. I yeah. can go on for, for a long time, but unfortunately, I can't. Where do we find you? We know we, we, you practice a ton of law. Tell us where we can grab you. Um, I'm at DLustESQ on Twitter. Um, you can get me. I'm an attorney for Goldberg Segala, 914-798-5429. Uh, All right. Well, don't go anywhere. We have to take a quick break, but don't worry. We'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this. All right, welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host, David Lesh. We are always encouraging you to stay connected. Tweet us at today's verdict. Well, we're very lucky to have our friends from the Bronx Defenders here who are going to discuss a little bit of the arraignment process, which, um, listen, I'm not a criminal defense guy. I, I don't really know this area, but to be quite honest with you, anytime it involves juveniles and a miscarriage of justice, we're all over here at today's verdict. So um, why don't, who wants to first start? tell me Tell the viewers a little bit about what the Bronx Defenders do. Who? So Please. the Bronx Defenders uh, represent uh, people in the Bronx who are accused of crimes um, and all of the court systems that come involved with that. That can involve immigration court, it can involve housing court, it can involve uh, social work consequences. It can involve family court consequences, and we have attorneys in all of those areas. We have social workers in all of those areas and advocates in all of those areas to help our clients with all of their needs. All right. Really, what you, what you mostly try and do is get bills through Albany, hopefully, pass and get laws passed to help a lot of the younger people in the Bronx who can't seem to get the proper type of representation. Let's talk about your latest um, uh, foray into bills, and that would be raising the age of the juveniles. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Robin and I are part of the As Adolescent Defense Project, and as a part of that project, we represent clients who are 14 to 16 years old, the youngest members uh, as a part of the holistic defense team. I'm a social worker as a part of that team. I work with attorneys to identify what the client's needs are through different assessments. And as a part of the new Res Raise the Age legislation, we now see that 16-year-olds are now eligible to have their cases sent to family court. And Robin can kind of Well, where was it before? I in mean, criminal that, that's court. Where, yes. It was mostly in criminal court, right. which is a completely different element, you know, in terms of the players, right? You got, let's talk about the main players. You have prosecutor, judge, um, police officer, and maybe defense attorney. I would assume that plays differently whether you're dealing with criminal court or family court, Robin. Am I, am I correct? It does play differently. So prior to the Raise the Age legislation, 16-year-olds were treated as adults in the criminal system. So they went to Rikers if bail was set. There, they, um, there was a facility called RNDC, Robert and Devoren Center, okay. where the 16 and 17-year-olds were housed, and it was the exact same horrible conditions as the rest of Rikers Island. Um, they were at risk of getting adult criminal records. They were subject to the same criminal penalties as adults. Now, since October 1st of 2018, there has been a change. It, it's not a simple change. Uh, all 16-year-olds charged with misdemeanors go to family court. They're treated as juveniles. 
16 year olds charged with felonies still start in the criminal court system as adults but a large number of them will then move to the family court system to be treated as juveniles. And what's that determination based on the type of crime, prior history? What would make them, why, is, why are some moved to family, why are some staying in criminal, why does that happen? There are two mechanisms by which a case can stay in adult court. The default is supposed to be to send the cases to family court. Um, but one is if the crime alleged is a violent felony, there is a test uh, that um, that the judge has to determine whether it's met. It's not based just on the charge. It also takes into account the alleged role specifically of that defendant, whether that defendant personally displayed a deadly weapon, for sure. example. Um, so they're not being dragged into adult court because uh, someone else, perhaps someone older, perhaps someone more culpable, has done something wrong and that this person is only alleged to be a minor player. So Elizabeth, I mean, you're on the ground level a lot mm -hmm. of times. I'm sure you're dealing with the moms and anybody else who's so afraid they have a child all of a sudden that's in the system, what's gonna happen. Um, what are your reactions you right. know, when, when this happens? Like, What's the first thing you think about in terms of trying to save this particular child? Because they're our child, right? Exactly. What, what do you do? How do you do it? Well, exactly what you're saying is that the spirit of Raise the Age was to recognize children as children, right? To say that they differ uh, from adults because their brains are not fully developed. Their reasoning has not developed. Their decision-making process. And so when I meet with a young person and their family, I'm there to say, you know, this is a scary process. Even the arrest experience itself can be very traumatizing. And so we provide supportive counseling to our youth to say, hey, let's help you to actually explain this confusing legal system, whether it's through family court or criminal court. Well, you know, we, we, you know I, I talked to you about a little bit of this on set, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really looking to scare somebody straight uh, in terms of like making sure that you know, they don't commit future crimes. Some would argue, though, that are we making it too easy for the younger population to avoid responsibility and not understand the consequences of their actions, especially when they get older, when they may uh, in their 20s and end up in jail. Um, would they be better served getting a, a little bit more of a taste of the criminal system when they're younger so they understand not to commit this more heinous crime? Robin, what do you think about that? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, for several reasons, but I'll start with two of them. Yeah. Uh, the first one being that, that that idea carries the assumption that family court isn't effective, and that's not true. Family court has teeth. So family court, the idea behind family court is that in theory it's supposed to be more rehabilitative instead of punitive. And so family court has a lot of services to guide a young person, to help them learn to make good decisions, to, uh, to address areas where they need help in their lives. There is also incarceration in family court. That's an, that is an option. And sure, that could certainly scare somebody, <laughs> somebody straight. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had mentioned on the, on, the, on the prompter, I was talking about a little bit of the um, handcuffing to yes. benches throughout the courthouse. Is this seriously happens? This seriously happens. The majority of our clients as they come through the police precinct are routinely handcuffed to benches as they await being processed and brought to the arraignment Why? room. Is there not a room for them to be able to, to sit? Well, in accordance to RTA law, they should be separated from adults, meaning that they cannot have any contact with them in cells. But compared to adults who, when they are arrested, they're able to walk freely in their cells, unrestricted and unrestrained. Children are actually held there, and this is for 12 or more hours until they're actually brought to the central booking to be arraigned. And even after that process, they wait another additional 10 or more hours just to see a judge and actually have their case called. And, and during these times, we're seeing that young people are not even offered food most of the time. They're just fed maybe in the morning and not until later at night and when they're I mean, arraigned. You just see what's happened in Rikers Island uh, last week with the, uh, with the heat wave and there was no air conditioning. The, you know, the prisoners had to stay in their cells. I mean, we, Imagine on a hot weekend like right. last weekend when a lot of our young people were held without Robin, water. Finally, that's it. Okay, um, some tips. Somebody's watching today. Maybe they have a, a son or a daughter who's gotten into some trouble. Um, what do you tell them to do quickly? Like, what should they do? 
and obviously get to you, uh, make sure they have proper representation, but anything else you might want to tell them? Well, first, get to a lawyer as soon as possible. Don't wait until their first court appearance to get to court, to get a lawyer. Uh, because what a lawyer can do is a lawyer can invoke a child's rights, make sure that the police aren't questioning them, aren't, um, aren't getting answers out of them that may hurt them or words that may be twisted. Uh, to be in front of a police officer is very intimidating and scary for By a child. Way, where do we find the Bronx Defenders? So At www.bronxdefenders.org. And if they need any sort of legal help, they can call our community intake line there. You guys do great work. You've been on before. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. All right, we have to take a quick break, but don't worry. We'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host, David Lesh. We are always encouraging you to stay connected. Tweet us at today's verdict. As social media keeps evolving, so is the ability of attorneys to use your everyday postings while in a courtroom. Here to tell us more is attorney Justin Blitz. And uh, Justin, you're a good friend and a good trial lawyer. I'm glad to have you here. Thanks. Thanks, all right. Steve. Um, social media has been in the news lately. Uh, certainly, certainly all types of stuff. We were just talking about even New York One. It's been on. What have you seen recently with respect to social media? You know, as, as you know, it's everywhere. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, it, 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 just looking at today's front headlines on my way getting dressed this morning New York one you're looking at the, uh, the, the the police officers who had water thrown on them that originally started with tweets of video of it and then even Puerto Rico the protesters I mean it's all getting expanded the 500,000 people showing sure. up social media but you know in, in in everyday practice of what I do personal injury medical malpractice wrongful death cases it's it's such a part of everyday life of our practice and, and I think that's what I think that's what the, the clients and the viewers really want to know how much of it is fair game I mean we spend our, our lives on Facebook and Twitter you, what you, can the other side get so what do you want to get what tell me a little bit about N that. New York has historically been a liberal discovery state sure. um, in last year the Court of Appeals in a 7-0 decision in a case form in Henkin basically it, said that if you have a factual predicate and if there is a reasonable calculation that it's going to lead, in other words, it's not a fishing expedition and based on potentially questions at a deposition or there's some factual basis of that it could lead to knowledge that will help the case one way or the other, the, if it's an injury case, then you're, th it's going to be fair game. And but there's things on there that's so private. There are things that we put on Facebook that we may not think is even connected. Pictures of ourselves in bathing suits, pictures of ourselves doing things that we never thought anybody would see, but you're telling us that there's a chance they can look at those things. This goes in all aspects of life, whether you're an injured person, absolutely, they can get it. And now, you know, last, just this year, the first apartment in a case, uh, Velasquez or Santos, they said that now the defendant's attorneys can make a motion to compel to have the plaintiff, the injured plaintiff's attorney, turn over the passwords to third-party mine, data mining companies. So you can now get the location services. You could find out where they were when they posted the picture. So in other words, you, you would be subpoenaing the, the, the third-party provider to find out exactly where, where the picture was taken. When where the civil it was library, taken. They're getting you know, the I never meta went tags. On You're getting all the underbelly of wow. the stuff. You know, it, it, there, there, there's no privacy anymore. If you go to takeout.google.com, takeout you can then get a email of all of your past websites, your location services. You know, this is, a f th there's no privacy and you have to be really, really careful. You know, what I found, because I, I was on one of these, what's called an in-camera inspection, you know, for the viewers, that's where a judge makes the determination as to what you can or cannot get. The judge allowed all the instant messaging. Anything on the instant messaging that you may have said, you know, or to, a, to a friend for years, private, private, you know, messages that related 
It was almost like you were getting somebody's private emails. There is such a power in this, in the phone, in the, in the ability to communicate instantaneously. And, you know, I've seen it even with doctors. I do a lot of malpractice work, and sometimes I've seen where a doctor will, will, will bring a malpractice case against the doctor, and then we'll find out that the doctor was texting with the patient, potentially inappropriately, potentially saying, I'm sorry for how this occurred. So it works both ways if you're the injured person. But, you know, there, there was a poll. They, they took a, a 1,700 residents were, were a poll. 70% of them are on Facebook. 45% of them see things that are against the professional standards on a daily basis. So it's going on both ends. It's, and if you're an injured person, if you're in an accident, you know, listen, I'm finding witnesses for car accidents and bus accidents through social media apps. And how do you do that? There's, there's an app right now called Citizens App where they it talk about, they, 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 they post various accidents that are occurring and people can comment on it. And we were looking, I, I had a guy who was riding his bike, he got hit by a bus, the bus driver denied hitting him, and we found a witness through Citizens App saying, hey, I saw a guy get hit by a bus on 26th and Madison the other day. We tracked him down, we got a subpoena through Citizens to find out his information, we got a deposition, it can change the course of a case. Where are we heading? <sighs> and that's a tough question for you, but there's so many different mechanisms to get, whether it's you know, Reddit or um, Tumblr, Facebook, there's so many different social media sites where we've put things down in our, in our past, we've posted photographs. It's, it's dangerous. I, I mean, there's almost no privacy, and if it, we go into a courtroom, is it, is it all fair game, really? You know, I think that at some point, it, the, the courts now have put this cage, so to speak. It has to be reasonably calculated, and you have to have a factual predicate. And as plaintiffs' attorneys, we have to remain very vi vi vigilant against our for our privacy. How do you do that? Privacy. You 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 make them provide a proper foundation. You make them provide a prima facie reason. It, it, this is not a fishing expedition. These are our clients' privacy. HIPAA privacy laws have to be taken very seriously. There's so much junk out there in the internet and that's the other problem with the yeah, social media. Some things may not even be true. Uh, more than half of our country is getting our news from the social media. I was reading the other day that there's websites like Forbes.com, they post, they posted an article about Jeffrey Epstein being a great scientist. They didn't have any editorial uh, review before they're posting it. Yeah. They're just paying off guys to send off these articles. There's, there's, so, so it's up to the courts. It's going to be up to the courts, and unfortunately, what's going to happen, as in all circumstances, as you know, it takes great tragedy. Unfortunately. And, and it'll take great tragedy, or it'll take someone with power, a great leader, being violated. Well, where do we find you? Somebody may have an accident I, or an issue of medical mal, where do they get you? I, I've been, we, we, we've been practicing for over 15 years. The firm is Shulman Blitz. We're located in Manhattan. It's www.shulmanblitz. I'm Justin Blitz. Um, I practice all over the state of New York, and I... Appreciate you having me. Let me, me tell on. you something. Reach out to him. He knows what he's doing. Thank you, David. Well, Thanks that's all me. the time we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and, of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you missed any part of today's show, be sure to check it out at www.bronxit.tv. Also, remember if there is a legal issue or topic you'd like to see on a future edition of today's verdict, feel free to contact me at David Lesh at bronxit.org or tweet us. At today's verdict, make sure to hash today's verdict for myself and all of us at today's verdict. Always remember, know your rights. Know your issues, reach a verdict. See you next time.